Good morning. You're listening to Talking Leadership with the Leadership Doc. That's me, Dr. Heather Williamson, and I am glad you're listening this morning because this morning, today, I have a, actually, we've known each other for many years, but a friend of mine, Paula Otto, who is uh, currently the partner with LeadSpark Consulting, and she's had many other roles in her life. We met when I was working and going through grad school at VCU. Yes. And uh, so we had started our relationship there and we have since continued doing some consulting with VCU and we've actually been having fun doing that together. But I wanted to get uh, listeners to really know you a little bit better. So share a little bit about what you do first and, and you know, how somebody would even contact you. Well, thank you, Heather. <laughs> thank you very much for having me. Uh, when I retired from the Virginia Lottery and State Service a couple of years ago, mm -hmm. I started to do consulting and partnered up with several other women to create Lead Spark. And um, if you go to leadsparkconsulting.com, you can learn more about us mm -hmm. and get in contact with us. And we do a variety of consulting and training. And really, our niche is leadership training, communications training. Uh, we'll also go into organizations and help them become more efficient operationally. Uh, and we, like so many people, pivoted during the pandemic mm -hmm. and have developed a number of webinars as well. So mm -hmm. that's a better way to deliver training uh, my um, niche with the group tends to be more communications focused. Mm -hmm. I started my career as a journalist and then moved into public relations and then taught journalism and public relations, uh, then made the jump back to the lottery as the CEO, as mm -hmm. the executive director, uh, and so have some leadership expertise as well. I also, while I was at VCU, taught ethics, mm -hmm. and um, that is one of the topics in conjunction with leadership mm -hmm. that I continue to really enjoy having conversations with business leaders about. So when I noticed also that you were one of the founders for the Virginia Lottery, so, and I know you were appointed by the governor, right? To be the executive director, That's I think. Right. Yes. And uh, so how... I wish I think the Virginia Lottery has a great, you know, avenue for giving back to the community, especially the school system, right. which is where the lottery dollars go, um, besides those winners, but <laughs> <laughs> which I've never really been a big winner, <laughs> but I think you have to pay to play, right? That's right. That's <laughs> right. Play to pay. <laughs> um so share a little bit about what that was like, because I mean, you have to have a lot of experience and somebody had a lot of faith in you to be able to think about establishing the Virginia Lottery and then running it for what, almost 20 years? Right. Well, yeah. 10, ten, ten years. years. So I had two different tenures at the lottery. Yeah. I was a reporter here in Richmond mm -hmm. covering the debate in the General Assembly, mm -hmm. then covering the referendum way back in 1987 when Virginians decided yes. They wanted to establish a lottery. And after the referendum, I thought, wow, wouldn't it be fun to be part of a startup organization mm -hmm. that literally is starting from scratch? Right. I grew up in Northern Virginia and both my parents worked for the federal government and my siblings and I all worked part time for the federal government when we were in college. So public service, government service was clearly in my DNA. Mm -hmm. So I covered the news conference for the first lottery director being appointed, Ken Thorson, mm -hmm. who was appointed by Governor Belisles. And that evening, I went home and wrote him a letter mm -hmm. and said, I covered the news conference. Congratulations on your appointment. I would like to be your public information director. Mm -hmm. So you got some, mm. what is that word? <laughs> yes. Yeah. I was thinking of another one, but would not be appropriate. Thank you very much. Well, and then I said, <laughs> I was in, I was third row, long blonde hair. And um, he very politely responded and said, you know, there will be a process. 
And uh, when the job description is written and it um, is official, uh, turn your letter over to HR. Uh, and then uh, the end of the story is a couple months later, I hadn't heard anything. Mm -hmm. And of course, they were just starting to hire people. And so the week I was getting married, I called them and said, I don't know where you are in the process, but I'm getting ready to be out of town for 10 days. And I'm very much interested mm -hmm. in this position. So I just want you to know, could you put a note in my file? The next day I get a call from them and they say, can you be here tomorrow to interview? <laughs> because we're getting pretty close and we don't want to miss you while you are gone. Mm -hmm. So I had to take off my, I'm getting married on Saturday brain and put on, <laughs> this is a job I really want. And so I interviewed Wednesday. Mm -hmm. And I actually got the call on my honeymoon that I had been <laughs> nice selected for the position. <laughs> and now this is, mind you, before cell phones and email, mm -hmm. uh, but I had given them the phone number to the hotel where we were staying mm -hmm. for our honeymoon. So it was quite a start uh, to my lottery career. So I was directing all of the public information, public relations efforts for those mm -hmm. first years. Part of, you know, the director's sort of kitchen cabinet, you know, I'm a, a senior leader. Then I went to VCU and worked in their communications department, had a leadership role there, was selected to go through the Grace E. Harris Leadership Institute, mm -hmm. which is part of the Wilder School. Right. And my mentor for my year in the Leadership Institute was President Dr. Eugene Trani. Wow, which how was just, just amazing. I mean, yeah. I kind of won the lottery, yeah. right? And so um, fast forward a few years and then Governor Kane uh, was looking for a lottery director. My name had been uh, talked about. Mm -hmm. They called me and VCU really helped me get that leadership experience and credentials mm -hmm. that made me a competitive candidate. I wound up going back to the lottery for 10 years mm -hmm. as the executive director. So besides handing out nice big checks, <laughs> what are some of the challenges that you experienced as an executive director over a huge agency? I guess you want to call it an agency or? Right. It, it isn't, mm -hmm. in, the lottery is an independent agency. Yeah. So it's still a state agency, mm -hmm. but um, it has a little bit more freedom uh, in terms of how it operates. Mm -hmm. And I think when the General Assembly created the lottery, they recognized it has a mission unlike any other state agency right. to develop, market, and sell gaming products. Mm -hmm. And now, of course, the lottery is also over casinos. right? And there's been a recommendation for it to have charitable gaming and horse racing also come under its mm -hmm. umbrella. But you're exactly right, Heather. And, you know, in the early days of the lottery, as the public information director, I would constantly say the lottery is important to every nook and cranny in Virginia. Mm -hmm. And when we would send out news releases in those early days, when it was done by mail, not email, <laughs> We had more than 400 media that we would send news releases to. Mm -hmm. And, you know, not everybody felt good about the lottery starting. And I actually would have some news organizations mail back the news release and say, we're not doing any stories about the lottery. Take us wow. off your list. And I said, I will never take anyone off the list. Yeah. I will always provide that information because the lottery is going to impact people all across the state. And that was one of the best parts of being the executive director of the lottery was to have an organization that truly was statewide. Mm -hmm. And it was also one of the most challenging because uh, about half the employees, maybe a little more than half, work at the headquarters in Richmond but the other half are spread out across the state. Mm -hmm. So how do you lead people effectively remotely? Yes. How do you make them feel a part of the organization? And um, there was an issue soon after I became lottery director where uh, there were some people in the customer service centers in the far western part of the state, mm -hmm. Roanoke, Abingdon. And there had been a contest and... Lottery employees are not allowed to play the lottery. Right. 
Um, this was a contest where if you had non-winning tickets, because they're never losers at the lottery, hmm. if you had <laughs> non-winning tickets, <laughs> you could enter this contest. And so there was some misunderstanding about what, if any, involvement employees could have yeah. in a contest like that. And it was a good wake up call for me that those of us sitting in Richmond in front of our computers most of the day mm -hmm. knew all the ins and outs and the nuances. Mm -hmm. And we were assuming people who worked hundreds of miles away who maybe had never been to the Richmond headquarters were hired in Roanoke or Abingdon, right. always worked there. And so we took a really hard look at our processes of onboarding mm -hmm. and particularly for those remote employees, making sure that uh, when we made changes in policy, um, that we had a good way to communicate with them. Right. Because I, you know, I've pretty much always, well, the bulk of my life I've worked remotely, whether in a sales role, I'm, you know, in a territory which was not in Richmond, even though the company was at the time headquartered here. I was in Lynchburg. I lived in Roanoke for a while. Um, and the messaging, everybody's going to be on the same page. Meaning exactly. it's, you can't have, let's say, Richmond having all this inside information perceived as inside information. They know what the heck's going on. But out in Southwest Virginia, which is several hours away, depending on where you are, um, they're just winging it because they're doing the best that they know how based on the information that they have. Right. And and also consideration. So uh, and I don't want, know what the number is now, but, you know, there were between 70 and 80 employees who literally worked out of their van, mm -hmm. who sales reps, who mm -hmm. service the retailers. Oh, I know, because I used to run into them. Lottery tickets. Back in the day. <laughs> and so sending an email at the beginning of the day announcing something important isn't necessarily the best way to reach all of those folks who mm -hmm. are out in the field all day. Yeah. So again, that that was an important lesson. Um, the lottery is fairly complex in that there's a security department, an information technology department, an audit department, mm -hmm. a sales and marketing department, obviously HR and finance. And really my role as the executive director was to be careful not to get too far down into the weeds, so to speak. Right. Um, to absolutely trust the very talented and dedicated people who were running those divisions, but to have that view from a little higher up mm -hmm. to make sure that all the pieces and parts were coordinating. Mm -hmm. And um, if there was a new mandate from the General Assembly or the mm -hmm. governor's office to figure out how we would fulfill that, most of all, it was to make certain that we continue to meet the goals right. of the forecast of what would be turned over to K through 12 mm -hmm. public education in Virginia. And, you know, uh, my mantra pretty much the entire time I was at the lottery was we don't want to ask for more dollars from our regular players. We, we want to have more players giving a few dollars. Right. And so we spent a lot of time. Just so you know, that would be me. <laughs> and that's okay. <laughs> we, you know, uh, on trying to expand the player base yeah. and uh, expand the accessibility mm -hmm. for, for people like you. You know, this time of year, the holidays, there are a lot of people who only play at the holidays. Right. They like to gift uh, mm -hmm. lottery tickets. There's the New Year's Millionaire Raffle. And so this is the one time that they pay attention and they enjoy purchasing lottery. And uh, some of the marketing folks would say, we've got to get those people to play all the time. Mm -hmm. And my view was, you know what? If we have December, January players, let's embrace them. Yeah. Let's appreciate <laughs> that they come in uh, at that time of year and let's make sure they have a good experience mm -hmm. so that maybe they will come back at another time. Right. So being in that leadership role, what are the leadership principles that guided you or, and that still guide you? Well, I think, you know, I used to say that the lottery was in the business of selling pieces of paper. Mm -hmm. And if anybody doubts the integrity and security of those pieces of paper, 
then the lottery is sunk. And so a large part of my role at the lottery, and I think in all of my leadership positions, mm -hmm. has been to fiercely guard mm -hmm. and protect the integrity of the organization. Mm -hmm. So that can mean a lot of different things. It can mean, you know, if you have a personnel issue, um, you know, thinking about the organization right. and what does this mean for the organization. We had uh, a case at the lottery where there were misprinted tickets. We mm -hmm. had a new game that went out and the error was found pretty quickly. And, and really lottery tries to operate in a no era error uh, kind of atmosphere, but that isn't always possible. It's mm -hmm. humans. Right. And uh, we, we had to figure out, well, what are we going to do for all the players who have these tickets that look like winners, but they aren't winners. Right. right? And there were um, some who said they aren't winners. The rules say it's not a winner. Mm -hmm. The barcode is correct. And my answer was, I don't have a barcode reader on my eyeballs. Yes. You know, it doesn't really matter that the barcode was correct. If you look at the game and the ticket, you have won. So we ultimately decided that um, we would give those players not the prize, right. but um, an inconvenience fee mm -hmm. um, to acknowledge this was an error. Mm -hmm. It really is not a winner. It looks like a winner. You thought it was a winner. And so we're going to give you $500 or a thousand dollars. And we had sort of a scale. Um, so again, that kind of went back to the integrity, mm -hmm. right? And ownership. There was a mistake and exactly, we had to own it. We had mm -hmm. to make good. And um, there were very few players who really sort of fought and said, no, I want the $7,000 prize, um, but recognized it, it was an error. It was mm -hmm. unfortunate. Um, and interestingly, it was an honest retailer who called us, who started detecting that there was a problem. Uh -huh. And uh, it was uh, it was a Sunday morning. We would always release new games on Sunday mornings. And uh, so we were very grateful. And I said, we need to do something for that retailer <laughs> who told us, I think there is something wrong with uh, with this ticket. So absolutely, fiercely, again, protecting the mm -hmm. integrity. You know, I think also I have always believed, and this is something that I learned from the first lottery director, Ken Thorson, you don't ask people to do anything that you won't do yourself. Yes. And I still have memories of uh, the week leading up to the very first ticket sales mm -hmm. happening. And boy, the lottery was pretty simple back then. It was one <laughs> ticket for one dollar. <laughs> Never has been that simple. But we had, I think, maybe 3,000, 3,500 retailers at that time. We were licensing them like crazy, yeah. packing tickets in the warehouse. And we realized we were not going to make it mm -hmm. on one shift a day at the warehouse. And so the lottery director would work all day, change out of his suit, and put on jeans and a t-shirt and sneakers and go work for several hours at the warehouse. Mm -hmm. And he never asked his senior leaders to join him. But of course, we saw him doing that. And we said, we, <laughs> we need to do that too. And, you know, yeah. it was, it was a stressful week leading up to the launch, mm -hmm. certainly. Um, but I, I can remember my, uh, my new husband, <laughs> you know, 10 o'clock, can I come pick you up from the warehouse yet? <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, so again, I think making certain that you don't ask other people to do something that you wouldn't uh, do yourself. And then I also think um, very much being accessible. You know, a lot of times when you get into an executive role, right? people want to protect you mm -hmm. and, you know, you're never available. And if you don't have an appointment, you can't see. Mm -hmm. And I really did not want to operate that way. Of course, there were times when I couldn't be accessible or I was behind closed doors, but I mostly wanted to be accessible. And um, about midway through my tenure as director, the lottery had to relocate its offices in downtown Richmond. Mm -hmm. We'd been in a state office building 
and we were moving just a couple blocks up the street to an office building that had been created by a public business was not built as a, mm-hmm. as a state building so it was maybe a little nicer than your average state office building yes and some of the corner offices had restrooms so my office had a restroom and I was really kind of conflicted. Mm-hmm. It's like, I don't, I'm not anything special. I, I really don't like having that. Can I have a different office yeah. for the planner? And they're like, no, 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 you got to have that office because there's a conference room next to it. So it was sort of my rule of thumb that I generally did not use that private restroom. Occasionally it was convenient to do that, but I would use the whole restroom mm-hmm. like all the other ladies. And I'll never forget one day I was in the restroom washing my hands and an employee walked in and said, Paula, (laughs) what are you doing in this restroom? Don't you have your own private restroom Mm -hmm. in your office? I said, well, yes, indeed I do. But I really prefer to use this restroom because look at this. It gives me the opportunity to ask you how things are going with the nonprofit that you work with that rescues dogs. Mm -hmm. And, and I really believe that, that that was a way to stay connected Mm -hmm. to employees. Um, The, the executive director suite also had a little refrigerator and, uh, and I was a lunch packer. Yes. I had a lunch meeting. I tend to pack my lunch but I never put it in the little refrigerator. Mm -hmm. I always put it in the lunchroom Mm -hmm. down the hall Mm -hmm. because that again gave me an opportunity to have some casual interaction with employees that I might not otherwise Mm -hmm. have a chance to have a quick word with. And I I think that's fabulous because that is coming from the heart. You're being authentic and authenticity within a leader is so important and you let people know that you cared about them, you know what's going on in their lives to even ask that question about that employee's nonprofit. And just, you know, you you lead by example, you own whatever comes down the road, whether it's a good thing, bad thing. And I, I think those are excellent leadership principles that guide you and can guide others as a leader in a role. Um, is there one that kind of stands out that you think would be like a requirement or should be a requirement for all leaders? Um, that's a great question because <laughs> I have like a list of 10 or 12. So yeah. it's over. But, um, but, you know, my, my training in college was information and reporting and journalism. So I'm a big believer that information is power. Mm-hmm. And so sharing information I think is absolutely critical to have good leadership Mm -hmm. and to have employees believe in you and trust you and want to work with you. Um, We had a a case where I had made a decision that was quite unpopular Mm -hmm. and uh, it had to do with pay raises. And as it happened, the timing of that decision was about two weeks before we were going to have an all agency meeting. So everybody from across the state was coming to Richmond and the folks who were doing the all agency meeting said after that decision, unpopular decision came down. Well, that's it. We're canceling the meeting. Mm-hmm. So, well, of course we're not. Well, nobody likes you right now. <laughs> so I really think it's not going to go well. Mm-hmm. This is supposed to be an upbeat meeting. I said, I understand that. But canceling the meeting would be a signal Mm -hmm. that I'm embarrassed, ashamed, don't want to own up to this very difficult decision. I would much rather start the meeting with me explaining, here's how I reached that decision. Mm -hmm. Anyone have any questions? Mm -hmm. Anyone want to complain? You can say whatever you want. And that's what we did. And we kind of got over it. Mm -hmm. And then we got on to the rest of the meeting. Yeah. Um, and I, I think I had one person who had told me I needed to cancel say, yeah, I guess you were right. Uh-huh. I, I, I guess so. So sharing information, being as open and as transparent mm-hmm. and involving employees in decisions, especially if it's going to impact them. Absolutely. Absolutely. Cause I think, um, you know, the higher you go in that leadership, uh, hierarchy, let's just call it, you know, the, the C-suite, I think that 
like you said before, you are protected or people do try to protect you. So you don't really know, have a good handle on what the other, the team members are really experiencing, what they're feeling. And because of the, the intention of trying to protect the executive, they miss out on a lot of opportunities that really could positively impact the organization and the team members. Absolutely. You know, one of the things that the lottery has always done is be involved in important community events. Mm -hmm. And so um, we find that lottery players and NASCAR fans are very much the same group. (laughs) So we would often have booths at um, the track in Bristol, Mm -hmm. as well as the track here in Richmond and Martinsville, and they'd be huge weekends. I would take a shift to sell tickets Mm -hmm. because it gave me a chance to meet the players and meet employees and use the machine to sell the tickets and say, why in the world did we put that button there instead of over there? Because three times I've hit the wrong button. Mm -hmm. Uh, And so uh, I I always try to, uh, I certainly couldn't do everybody's job, but I wanted to try to experience uh, most of the jobs mm-hmm. at the lottery or mm-hmm. or hear from folks. What are what are things that are great about your job? What are things that we could help make it better mm-hmm. for you to serve your customers? Excellent. Excellent. And uh, you do say one thing as one of the principles is that is to say thank you. Absolutely. The gratitude. That's right. And you know, I uh, I guess I've always been a thank you kind of person. Mm-hmm. And the first couple of months when I was back at the lottery as the director, and you know, if you're part of the senior leadership team, you have a new CEO, it's tough figuring yeah. them out. What are they like? What don't they like? Uh, you know, how can I win favor with them? And so we would do weekly meetings and I would pretty much always call out one or two people about really great job on that. Thank you for that. Thank you for your leadership. And um, several weeks in, one of the folks said to me, Paula, you are really embarrassing us. We really hate this thank you thing that you're doing. It's like, are you kidding? Were they speaking for everybody or themselves? (laughs) And so the like, you know, um, Acknowledge sort of public like, acknowledgement, yes. right? And so I, uh, I said, all right, well, I'll try to tone <laughs> it down a little bit. And I did try to, you know, kind of keep track because I didn't want to overly thank one group and not yeah. not another group. But you know, pretty much, I said, well, that's me. Yeah, I'm someone that says thank you, uh, and and I think that's important. And and part of that is also acknowledging whose idea is it. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, as a leader, you like to take credit for everything. Well, they work for me. And right. I'm the big cheese. But I always tried, and I'm sure there were times when I did not, I wasn't successful, to give credit where credit was due. Mm-hmm. You know, if we implemented an idea, I would say, well, you know, originally this was so-and-so's idea. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, we've made some modifications and and now we're doing it and it's really making a difference. We did a fun thing every year. We would let lottery employees submit ideas for a scratcher ticket. Mm-hmm. And I was gen- getting ready to ask you that. And generally one would be chosen, uh-huh. you know, and we'd make a big deal. And I think they'd get a little monetary award. And that was something else that we did. We called them spot awards. Mm-hmm. So if you saw someone doing something great, extra special customer service, Mm -hmm. you know, covering for an employee, a fellow employee, um, then managers could give them a spot award and you do just a little write up and they'd get a $25 gift card, but Mm -hmm. it was like an on the spot. Wow. Earlier today, I saw that someone was late getting back from lunch and you very, you know, carefully uh, covered for them, Mm -hmm. whatever it was. So I think not only you as a leader need to say thank you, but you need to make sure that your management team right. has whatever tools they need um, to say thank you. One of the other things I did, um, and this was really just, again, trying to have a touch point with every employee, is that I sent every employee a birthday card. 
well, that's not a big deal. That's not a, you know, a new idea, but lottery employees cannot play the lottery. Mm -hmm. So I would drive to North Carolina and get North Carolina lottery <laughs> tickets oh. and give them. So you, you can't play. So like Powerball and Mega Millions, because it's offered in Virginia, you couldn't do that. Uh -huh. But scratch tickets from another state, uh -huh. you, you could do. So one year I did that. Who knew? And then <laughs> another year, uh, and I did this a couple of years, I would do a birthday raffle. Uh -huh. And so everybody, say, in the month of December would get a raffle ticket. And then I would choose several and they would get gift cards. So, you know, just a little thank you, a little acknowledgement. You might be in Abingdon or Roanoke. Mm -hmm. I may never have met you. Mm -hmm. But I'm acknowledging that it's your birthday. Mm -hmm. And here's just a little something from the executive director. I think you were an amazing boss in the employees and the Virginia Lottery. We're lucky to have you. Well, thank you. And now you get to share that same wisdom and experience with your consulting firm, which is awesome. So again, how do people get in touch with you? So leadsparkconsulting.com mm -hmm. uh, has all of the contact information. Um, you also can reach me in my personal email, which is VA, as in Virginia, VA mm -hmm. Paula Otto at gmail.com. And, uh, you know, I, I love talking with leaders and emerging leaders mm -hmm. about some of my life lessons, um, some good, some not so good, but mm -hmm. we learn from all of them. Uh, and I, I'm really enjoying being back at VCU and mentoring some early career professionals. Uh, Absolutely. It's really very satisfying. And uh, I, I, I enjoy doing that. It's one of the <laughs> favorite things I do. Awesome. So thank you so much for sharing your experience, your gift, and, uh, and hopefully people will reach out to you. So that's going to do it for us this morning. Thank you for listening to Talking Leadership with the Leadership Doc, me, Dr. Heather Williamson on ESPN 106.1 FM. And until next time, have a great day. Bye.